Dallas, Texas, one of the world's fastest growing cities. An international crossroads. Shut the bullet in the canal. Where people come in search of a new start. Came from Poland. And a new life. But on a bad day, there is only one language spoken. The language of pain. When only hospitals can provide refuge. Is it better Spanish or English? In the melting pot. In Dallas, one out of every three people is a first or second generation immigrant. Twenty-three-year-old Manuel Cordero is one of them. He was shot as he tried to get away from a robber. Tell me what happened. Somebody. Okay, do you know who it was? You know what they shot you with? How far away were they when they shot you? Oh. Hey, my friend, talk to me. Did they shoot you through a car door or through the house, or were you walking or what? Oh, we're walking. In the emergency room at Methodist Medical Center, injuries take precedence over origins. Trauma, fortunately, is trauma, and so everybody bleeds the same way, everybody, and you manage the injuries the same way. And uh, as far as dealing with the families, you have to uh, take them individually. He's got this busted femur on this side. This is going to hurt just for a moment. We're going to roll you. Look for any more gunshots in your back. He's got a, he's got a hole up his cheek over there. Oh, oh, grab me some, oh, oh, hang on. Sorry. Just grab me uh, four more femur, two of them shit. <laughs> Can I see you wave your toes over here? The bullet missed Manuel Cordero's major arteries and blood vessels, but shattered the top of his right thigh bone. We're going to straighten this leg out. I've given you a little bit of pain medicine. We're going to be pulling your, your leg down in that direction, down there, and putting you in a traction, OK? This doesn't feel good. OK. Warm blankets. They fully. My bones broke. Shattered. Okay. Up high, up in this area here. The only way to fix this is to operate on it, okay? Hey, you guys up and running yet? How much longer? Because I got a gunshot over here. Hey, how you doing? All right, I'm Dr. Brown, one of the surgeons. Do you remember what happened to you? Look at that, you got popped right in his butt cheek right here. Went through this spear portion and exited laterally right away. He's got good pulses all the way. We rolled him up to his back and they didn't see anything else further than that. Okay. If Manuel doesn't have surgery, he will be crippled for life. Lateral on that aspect and then came out lateral on this side. You can see his inner choke right there, birds hanging. Christina and Thomas Kukielka have come all the way from Poland to get help for their baby daughter, Agata. Their journey began the day their child was born. I had a C-section and um, they took the baby out and they noticed that um, there are um, congenital defects. Agata has a rare defect called frontal nasal dysplasia that affects the bones of her face. <laughs> you know, I have no comparison to how I would love a healthy child, but, you know, we love her so much. I think she's um, the best baby we could have. <laughs> the Kukielkas have brought Agata to the U.S to the International Craniofacial Institute at Medical City Dallas Hospital. Tomorrow, she will undergo extensive surgery to correct the dysplasia. We've treated children from 75 countries and every state in the U.S. here at Medical City Dallas at our craniofacial center. She has this bump here. 
It seems to be a cartilage. It's, I think yeah. it's cartilage, yeah. but it's abnormal cartilage. Mm -hmm. yeah, and sure. Dr. Kenneth Salyer will reconstruct Agata's face, reshaping her own flesh and bone. But I need to take this and rotate it there. Our fight was to find the money for the surgeon. This, this was the worst part of it. And we didn't, we didn't uh, manage to gather all the required money. And uh, Dr. Salyer is going to do this surgery with the money that we have. To prepare for the operation, Dr. Salyer's surgical team will rely on detailed pictures of Agata's deformities taken by CT scan. The CT scan will also allow them to create a copy of Agata's skull, accurate to within one millimeter. We split two sides of the face and move those together. So this will bring the eyes closer, but um, he said that from his experience, they cannot be put in the proper position at one stage. It will be like um, a thumb, you know, distance and uh, in the second stage they will, he will put them close we were just scared to have her operated in Poland because uh, she could die during the, 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 this surgery but without this surgery she could also die Medically, she'd have many problems. Uh, she can't breathe at this time adequately. She'd have malocclusion. She has problems feeding. She has problems with her vision. She, it would be, it'd be a major catastrophe. When this day began, Beatrice Lopez never expected to wind up in the hospital. I can't breathe. It hurts from here to here, all around. She was on her way home when the car she was in suddenly crashed. The truck, uh, he, yeah. in the he was going to turn left, but he tried to pass. And we don't have time to put the brakes on. So we hit the truck and the pole. One, two, three. Ah! Her back may be seriously injured. Before the doctors can treat her, they need to x-ray her spine with a CT scan. Within minutes, doctors spot the problem. She was in a car accident, she was restrained. She had no loss of consciousness and everything was pretty much stable. A lot of times patients that are restrained and no loss of consciousness, not a very bad mechanism. Uh, if their CTs are negative, they can go home. But her CT showed that she had uh, compression fracture. Hi, Ms. Lopez. My name is Dr. Sarger. I work with Dr. Belay. Mm -hmm. They tell you what they found in the CT? Well, yeah, one of your uh, vertebrae is a little compressed. And so what we're going to do is we're going to keep you in the hospital, and we're going to have the neurosurgeon come and take a, a look at you in the morning. Tomorrow morning, doctors will discover a different problem, one that could leave Beatrice paralyzed. Let's see some more padding up here. In the OR, Dr. Hernandez is about to rebuild Manuel Cordero's bullet-shattered thigh. They measure both legs to be sure the final result doesn't leave his injured leg shorter than the other. Look like he's in line. Okay, lock. Just by putting him on the fracture table, we were able to recover some of his length. Sure. Again. Again. 
This operation will involve tools more suited to a carpenter than a surgeon. And we're going to make our incision just proximal to it. Good. A titanium rod will run from his hip to his knee, and two large screws will hold it in place. It's a fixed angle between the rod and that screw, so you have to insert the rod so that the level of the screw is right into the head, and then on both the AP and the lateral views. So that's the hardest part about this one. Shoot that. It's a kind of scaffolding that will support the leg while the dozens of tiny pieces of bone mend. This is that distal interlocking screw, and this will make sure that he doesn't shorten at the fracture site, and make sure that his distal femur doesn't rotate around the nail. Shoot. As this rod is down the center of the shaft, then to keep it from shortening, we put this distal interlocking screw in, and that one is going to go through the shaft, through the nail, and across into the opposite cortex. So that'll, that'll lock it and keep the whole femur from shortening. The rods and screws are intended to help Manuel regain the full use of his leg so that he will walk normally. But first, he faces a long and painful recovery. Between 1990 and 2000, the Hispanic population in Dallas increased by 110%. One of those immigrants is 34-year-old Victor Rivera. Victor is badly injured. An hour ago, he was driving along a Dallas freeway with a friend when a tire on their truck blew. While Victor was changing it, the truck fell, crushing his chest. Let's do a UAO, level one. All right, he's going down. He's going down. I need you to order me a gram of uh, silver from the now this guy. Victor is too seriously hurt to give the trauma team any medical history. You need more gloves? No, this activity that we saw here was either seizure activity or a response people can get from um, an acute brain injury pattern. Got a 10 cc syringe? Good. Now he's up here on the left. Did we get a pressure on him? Yes. Hey, You've got blood coming out the right. There's blood out of the right ear. How long was this car on him? They said about five minutes before they knew it, about five minutes to get it off, about, probably about 10. I don't feel anything on his back of his head, Bob. No crepitance. It's bloody back there, but I think that's coming out of his nose. Did he get an OG yet? Yeah. OK. No. Let's get a Foley, and then we can go. Let's go to CT. Victor needs a CT scan immediately. If his brain is bleeding, he may be left with severe brain damage. Three thirty p.m. A care flight team touches down at Methodist Medical Center with a patient who may have a crippling spine injury. They've flown in from Canton, Texas, sixty miles east of Dallas, where rain-slicked streets and heavy traffic resulted in chaos. Restrain the driver of the vehicle that was T bone bilaterally on each side. I said uh, massive damage to the vehicle. They have not done any lab work on her. They've done the C spine only. She is alert to name and age only. She did give them her parents' number, but she doesn't have recall of what the date is. And if she's not, she has questions to what happened, where was she? The accident victim is 39-year-old Carla Free, a mother of four and a student nurse. I gave her some Demerol, uh, 25 milligrams, and put her in 12.5 for her headache and lower back pain. She complains of back pain when you press on her pelvic area. Headache, I didn't get really palpate her head much. 
but she does know that she's supposed to graduate from nursing school next Friday. All right. So. Okay. Sorry, sweetie. You're going to feel a big stick, okay? Yeah. Okay. A real steel. One, two, three. Carla, do you hurt anywhere? I'd be happy you plugged a hole with it. My mm head -hmm. and my back. Dr. Glass, 204, please. Hey, ma'am. Dr. Glass here attending. Remember what happened to you? No, yeah. You don't know? What was the last thing you remember? Thanks, Rod. Ma'am? The last thing I remember? Uh huh. I, I don't remember. You don't remember anything? You were in a car wreck. Do you remember that? No. You don't remember being in a car? No. Okay. Do you know where you're at now? Hospital. Okay. It sounds like you suffered some type of head injury. I didn't get all the details. Some type of auto accident. Okay. I'm right. going to push on your hips a little bit. Okay. Okay. You can move your legs okay. Wiggle your toes. Okay. Legs are okay. Good. Arms are fine. Squeeze my hand here. Squeeze. Good. Squeeze over here. Okay, squeeze my hand. Okay, good. They're gonna do a CAT scan of your head and the rest of your body, okay? And like I said, we're a trauma center, so we have a trauma team, an in-house trauma surgeon, and then they'll take a look at you, okay, and then put you in the hospital, okay? Because it sounds like you're at, you're at Methodist Medical Center in Dallas. When Beatrice Lopez first arrived at Methodist Medical Center, her injuries seemed minor. But later, tests revealed serious fractures in her spine. Well, I feel my legs. That's one thing they say I'm lucky. Because with that kind of injury I got in my back, it should be paralyzed. Ms. Lopez, how are you doing? Okay. You all ready for surgery? She's actually very fortunate because a lot of people come in with unstable fractures like she has, and they have bone fragments that's pushing on the spinal canal, and they have a lot of neurological deficits, or some people can't move their legs or feel anything at all. She's very fortunate in the fact that she can move her legs and feel everything below the level of the injury. Paralysis is still a possibility. The wrong move in surgery could leave Beatrice a paraplegic. It is very delicate because obviously you're working around her nerves, her spinal cord, and there's not any extra room for anything else. So when you're working around critical structures like that, you have to be very careful not to inadvertently put any pressure on them. Dr. Geary will repair Beatrice's fractured spine using metal hooks and pieces of bone. The surgical team expects this very sensitive operation to take about four hours. What we're going to do today is uh, Go from the back and try to restabilize your spine. Dr. Geary cuts through the layers of skin, muscle, and fat on Beatrice's back until the spinal cord is exposed. When I do that, you see a normal amount of movement between these two vertebral bodies, and uh, that's most likely between L1 and L2 where the fracture is. It should not be that mobile. Right now, I'm just taking away some little bit of bone called the lamina so I can place the hooks underneath it. This is one of the hooks. We're gonna place four hooks on each side like this. The shiny part right here is the dura, and inside the dura is the spinal fluid and all the nerves floating in there. This is the most dangerous part of the operation. One wrong move, and Beatrice might never walk again. You saw the dura underneath, and you have to be very careful not to press on the dura or to... The dura is a membrane, and you have to make sure that you don't create a hole in it because there's spinal fluid and nerves underneath. Once I finish making the construct, then I'm going to be able to move it, and it's going to move in one block, so that there's going to be no movement between anywhere along between the levels where I fuse the spine. From this vantage point, Dr. Geary can't actually see the fractured area of Beatrice's spine. That's why I've been doing X-rays so 
frequently throughout the case, obviously because it's very important that you're at the right level and you're freezing the right level. And uh, you're relying on radiographic studies basically for this case. So we have all the eight hooks in there now. And uh, next thing we're gonna do is contour a rod to fit over the spaces that we're trying to instrument or fuse. The rod is titanium. Ready? Yeah. Once it's the correct length, Dr. Geary bends it to the proper angle. Beatrice will probably have this rod in her back for the rest of her life. She'll know it every time she bends or twists. That looks pretty good right there. It will affect her movement uh, probably about 20% or so of her movement forward and rotational movement sideways is gonna be decreased or limited because of this. When I place this coker on one of the rods and move it, you can see that there's nothing moving from here to here. The whole, whole unit moves as one. That indicates that the rod is going to hold the bones in one position while things heal. Despite the strength of the titanium, it won't be the metal that ultimately supports Beatrice's spine. It will be her own bone harvested from her hip. Okay. When Dr. Salyer examines baby Agata, he doesn't just see the dysplasia that has deformed her face. He sees things the rest of the world doesn't notice. Well, it's our idea to take this side of the face and this side of the face and actually take a big V out of the central portion and working inside the brain, protecting it inside the head, and then we will actually cut the entire orbit, split the palate, and move this half of the face and this half of the face closer together. The operation will be long, and risky. As a result of this operation, she could uh, have blindness. She could have uh, some infection, which would, could cause uh, additional damage. It's an extensive case where the brain is open to the orbits and is open to the mouth. We have to be ready, you know. We, we did everything we could to get to the last place. We, uh, we think that this is the best place, and uh, the rest is in the we hands of We have to trust, you know, and, and God. Yeah. Early tomorrow morning, Agata's transformation will begin, the first of several operations that will give her a chance at a better life. At Methodist Medical Center, Victor Rivera is about to undergo a CT scan on his brain. The images will reveal any signs of damage caused when a truck fell on his chest. We sonogrammed his abdomen, which looked on the initial blush looked negative, didn't see any blood in his belly. His chest film doesn't show any blood in his chest either. When Victor was brought into the emergency room, he was having seizures, probably caused by a lack of oxygen. The main thing I found was uh, he does have some swelling in the eye. We call it the conjunctiva, or the white part of the eye that is swollen. Yeah. That uh, may mean that there may be some lack of oxygen to the head or the face at one time. One of Victor's lungs has collapsed. This is like any other traumatic asphyxia. You can't ventilate, and uh, these guys struggle for for air, and you could see from here up, from the nipples up, he had this red, blotchy pattern called petechia. Um, so he may have some problems uh, if he didn't get oxygen there for a period of time, which apparently he didn't. The main treatment for somebody who has gone through this is to make sure that uh, the blood pressure is being maintained and make sure that he's getting enough oxygen at this point. His doctors hope Victor Rivera will live, but in what condition? For the moment, it's a waiting game. All right, sweetie, it's time. 
It's about 6.30 on the morning of Agata's surgery. Time for the Kukielkas to put their baby into the hands of Dr. Salyer and his team at the Craniofacial Institute. But almost as soon as surgery is to begin, the situation changes radically. Agata's blood isn't clotting properly. We found out that her PTT, her prothrombin time was prolonged. And uh, this meant that she had some kind of abnormality. Agata might bleed to death on the operating table. The surgery is too risky and must be postponed. Two hours into surgery at Methodist Medical Center, Dr. Geary is harvesting bone from Beatrice Lopez's hip. He'll use it to rebuild her broken spine. Uh, we're going to take out not a whole lot. We're going to mix some of this bone with some donor bone and place it uh, laterally for the fusion. What you want is the bone to actually take over, stabilizing the spine over time. We're going to mix it with something called demineralized bone matrix, and it's sort of a putty-like substance. And we're going to mix the two together, and uh, that'll hold it in position. And your body's own natural bones will start going into it and feed the spine. The putty-like substance was first developed in the 1980s and is now widely used in this type of reconstructive surgery. I'm going to use a drill and take off some of the surface of the bone. And that, basically what that does is when you place bone on top of the surface where I have drilled part of it off, it stimulates bone formation. So the bone is going to form much more quickly. We're going to place the uh, demineralized bone matrix on top of this. I'm just using my fingers to pack this in with laterally here. And it's going to become hardening. And that should uh, form a nice solid mass over the next three to six months, and the spine should be uh, fused in that position. In three months, new bone should form and be as strong as the original. Following surgery, Manuel Cordero's family is learning his prognosis from Dr. Hernandez. From the gunshot wound, he's going to have problems with the limb. He's always going to hurt. He uh, he has a nerve, nerve injury to the leg, and it's the nerve that allows him to pull his ankle up. So he may need to have a brace on his foot at least for the first few months, maybe even longer. Manuel is not out of the woods yet. He will remain in the hospital for at least a week and may require further surgery to repair his injuries.
Victor Rivera is asleep, sedated to give his mind and body time to recover from a life-threatening lack of oxygen. He had been telling me for a year and a half to visit him. And finally I come. And look what condition I find him in. I feel very bad. I cannot sleep. I cannot eat. I always want to be here all the time. I cannot stand the idea of him dying or leaving. I don't want for him to die. His family watches by his bedside, silently praying for his recovery. And right now I'm checking on a pupil to make sure that the pupils are reactive. And when I shine a bright light, a normal uh, pupil would react to light and constrict, uh, getting smaller. And that tells me that the part of the brain that come down to go to the eye uh, and go to the pupil are working. Uh, at this point, I think uh, we're all very optimistic because uh, he seems to be moving his arms and legs. He seems to be comprehending some simple instructions. But of course, to really test his uh, cognitive function, we have to wait till he's fully awake before we can do that. You know? We pray to God that soon he will recover. We feel more optimistic. We hope and trust in the Lord that he, he will heal. If Victor reawakens tomorrow, it will be the doctor's first chance to fully diagnose the possible long-term damage caused by his accident. As kind of her goopy juice. Look, get her ready for surgery. Five days after the first attempt at Baby Agata's craniofacial surgery, she and her parents are back to try again. Let me give it to her. This time, doctors have given the baby a drug to take care of her blood clotting problems. She received the medication one hour before the surgery in order to increase the blood clotting capabilities of the blood. It looks like everything is prepared and secured this time. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, Esther should be out there. Okay, let's go do it. Check and see if we got them. And, and then I'll have them split, split the unit. Split the unit. I have that one here. Okay. Yeah. We're going to go to my room. Some of my toys with you. Okay. I want the, the pulse oximeter on the right toe. Yeah. The blood pressure on the right. In the OR, monitors register every aspect of Agata's vital signs. Do you like red? No, red's always everybody's favorite color. Everybody's favorite color is red. The surgery is expected to take between 8 and 10 hours, but it is so complex that any unforeseen complication could dramatically slow their progress. We have the operation planned out, marked it out in methylene blue, and we're making the initial incision in the scalp and turning the soft tissues of the face down from the bone to get exposure in intra cranially and to get exposure on the outside of the face. So we have complete control of the vital structures of the face. So we gotta, I think, somehow, I think, go classically, although you can probably already free this up a little bit. And mm -hmm. we can probably have two, 
two surgery. flaps. Two flaps, probably, and I'm going to probably... Based here or based on the... <laughs> the surgeons then cut out large chunks of baby Agata's malformed skull. They plan to reshape them, then replace them. See this? It's weak right there. The bone was weak, and it was it, getting stabilization was not easy. And I had to add some little uh, titanium plates and screws to give us good stabilization of the segments. Now you're doing the it. So we have to put a couple of plates on each side. This type of procedure for craniofacial surgery is really the ultimate challenge because we have parts and shapes and forms that aren't there. So we really have to create those. We have to sculpt those out of what we're given. Cases as complicated as Agata's are relatively rare. Dr. Salyer sees only a handful of deformities similar to hers every year. We need to take some bone for a nose. And what we have out there we need for the forehead. And we went down to the palate. And then as we had predetermined, we actually split the palate. And then that allowed us to split the face into two segments. This thing's starting to move. And it's moving with the palate. And everything's intact the way I want it. Hi. Everything's coming along OK? So now we have the um, two sides of the face mobilized. And so now we're going to work on putting the orbits together. Dr. Uh, Shapiro's working on closing some little places in the dura. We'll get that closed and sealed, and then we'll start rebuilding. Mm -hmm. So the rebuilding will take a long time. Agata has already been in surgery for four hours. Despite the good news, her parents are realistic about the difficult work still ahead wait for the results. It's a surgery is always risky, no matter where it takes place. So, but we hope that everything will go fine. I think that's right. Carla Free survived a terrible car accident, but she's having acute head pain, pain that could indicate a serious brain injury. She's been sort of answering repetitive questions, sort of amnestic. She doesn't remember what happened, so she probably suffered some type of head injury, whether she has a bleed or just a concussion. So you're driving? You're the driver? You don't remember? You don't remember what happened? Carla doesn't remember her accident. She'd been driving through rain and heavy traffic. When a car cut across lanes, Carla swerved to avoid it and spun 360 degrees, T-boning into an SUV. Her car was totaled. She's lucky to be alive. We basically do a CAT scan of her, of her head or neck or chest or abdomen pelvis just to make sure that she doesn't have a bleed, she doesn't have a neck fracture or any internal injuries. So pretty much just CT of all of her internal body. Uh, she's complaining of head pain. We were just wondering if something was going on uh, in her head. Everything looks fine. Previously, you know, I thought there was a questionable bleed, but it looked grossly normal. She's stable. The neurosurgeon can come and see her in the morning. Carla will likely remain in the hospital for up to a week. And though she fractured her pelvis and sacrum, her injuries don't appear to have caused any long-term problems. For me. Beatrice Lopez came through her spinal surgery with all her movement and sensitivity intact. How about this? Can you feel this? Good. Everything went really well. I'll go talk to your family out there and let them know that everything went well. Okay? How are you? I don't feel anything. I don't remember anything. That's good. At least you don't have any pain. Everybody was going to say that you were going to feel pain, Mom, and I was just so sad. Uh -huh. But the preacher said that 
once it's gone, you're gonna be able to jump again and dance and go clubbing. So they have to take uh, part of my hip or not? Yeah, they did. They did. Or go bone grab? Mm -hmm. He said they might have to do that. He didn't want for sure until they got it. I think she's gonna do very well. You know, six months, a year from now, she's gonna be back to normal. Over the next you know, couple of weeks, it's going to be rough ride. Her back is going to hurt. She's gonna be need to be motivated and force herself to get up and walk around. But uh, I think she's gonna do very well from this and make a complete recovery. So how long before you start dancing again, Beatrice? <laughs> uh, that's gonna be a two or three weeks. <laughs> For Manuel Cordero, just getting out of bed is an ordeal. Well, it's bad, I mean, it's bad. <laughs> I never want to feel this again. He remembers being shot, but the details are sketchy. Yeah, please stand up. I've got you. I just, I was walking and somebody asked me for my money. He tried to hit me and what I do was I walk because he hit me, right? So what I do a couple steps, and when I was running that way, he just he shot me. Don't wear yourself out. Do as much as you can. I can walk with the crutches. It's, it's all. So it hurts when I walk a little bit because I'm weak, you know, for stay here. Now his biggest problem is that when the bullet went through, the same energy that damaged the proximal femur damaged uh, the nerve to his leg. So he's had a foot drop and he can't pull up on his ankle, pull up on his great toe. He has numbness in his foot. Some of that should resolve, but it may take up to six to eight months. Mm -hmm. Turn around and go back. They're gonna give me a therapy, you know, therapy, and they're gonna tell me when I'm going to start to put weight on my leg, it's all. I mean, I really, like the doctor said, we need weight. So, that's all what I know. No matter what, Manuel's recovery will be long and hard. Three days of drug-induced sleep has done its healing work. Victor is now awake and seemingly alert. Good. You want to come down and walk? Stand up over here. The last thing Victor remembers is pulling over to fix a flat tire. Nothing about the truck that fell and almost killed him. Do you recall that the ambulance picked you up and brought you to the hospital? No. 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 Oh, you have no, no memory of the ambulance ride to the hospital then? No, 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 when they came, when they desperate, no. So, when you woke up, you found yourself in this room, is that right? So, when you woke up, you found yourself in this room, is that right? Like this. That is a very sensitive test to see whether a person has any problem with coordination. He seems to have good balance. Very good, okay. Okay, go back to the bed now. How's your pain? Still on? It's okay? Okay. The next step is to, to get him up and move around. I think overall he should make a very good recovery as soon as the pain on the chest uh, is uh, resolved. Victor's brush with death was brief but intense. Now, however, he's almost back to good health. In a few more days, he should be up and walking. Mobilization is difficult because of the smallness of the child. Five hours into baby Agata's surgery, Dr. Salyer and his team are about to begin the most critical stage. Hold this. Mm -hmm. Now that the baby's skull and facial bones are split in two, the surgeons have to put it all back together. Better. Drifting down 
Right here, right the hole. I have a bone holder. Doctor, that's the nose? Yeah. We have to work in the nose all day long. I don't like it, but we have to. Building a nose is a particular challenge. We don't have any cartilage. I thought that deformity in there was going to be with cartilage, you know? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to thin this fat out a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then bring all of this in this way, huh? The question is, we got this close enough together, huh? Agata's skull didn't fully cover her brain, so the surgeons add bone to fill in the gaps. That's demineralized bone, it's donor bone, it's, it's specially treated human bone. But it take, all the minerals are taken out and it's sterilized three processes to knock out any possible viruses. Bit by bit, titanium plates and sutures knit skin and bone back into a hole. Gradually, a new and much improved face emerges. I'm pleased with the contour of the cheeks that we got, with the overall balance of the eyes and the, the, the ability to translocate the orbits and at the same time translocate the globes and get them into a no, more normal position. Okay, we're all through. You have a cute Thank little you. baby. It's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. She's fine. She's fine. Everything went fine. I think she That was great. After nine hours of surgery, Agata's reconstruction is only just beginning. In the years ahead, Agata will need perhaps as many as eight more surgeries. This is why we do this work, and this is what really uh, warms our hearts, because we've uh, reconstructed a face and created a new eye. Baby Agata, Beatrice Lopez, Victor Rivera, and Manuel Cordero. Four lives that faced crisis, four lives now restored. In the melting pot of Dallas, new life continues to flourish. <laughs>